Conducting an in-depth interview. From your reading and your reflection, you should be able to answer these three questions. What is an in-depth interview? What skills should an interviewer have? And what is a stage of the in-depth interview process? If you're still struggling with some of these questions, um, feel free to post within our discussion board or contact me directly. Hopefully within the course of this PowerPoint, we will be able to answer some of your questions. The first question is, why do we use in-depth interviews? Hey all. Hey all. So, so why do why we, we use in-depth in interviews? interviews? Why would why we would even, even um, consider um, doing that? Why is this why even is important? important? Why are we learning it? Especially, especially right now, right now where, where we really can't really interview, interview anyone. anyone. So, so um, um, we actually we use, use, could use, use in-depth in interviews, interviews um, a lot in your career, in your career no, no matter, matter where, where you might be working. working. So, so say that you decide, decide to go into, into administration, administration and, and you, you wanted, wanted to do an in-depth in interview um, with, with some, some of the workers that you were working with um, to find out job satisfaction, or you wanted to find out an answer to a problem. So say you're noticing that a lot of clients are dropping out, and, and you, you wanted, wanted to hear from some of the direct care staff, staff about, about why that, that might be. be. You, you also, also might be wanting to ask clients why that might be. be. So that, that could be one way that you use an in-depth in interview. interview. Um, another, another thing that you could use an in-depth in interview for um, are for performance measures. Um, you could also use in-depth interviews um, for gaining pilot data um, for research for a research endeavor. Um, say that you were um, you had your own daycare and you wanted to get some um, some in-depth information um, regarding um, best practices um, or um, how the teachers or how the little kids were doing, an in-depth interview will work there as well. So it's one of those things that once you learn it, you can transfer it to a lot of different areas. Um, so it's a very good skill to use no matter where you go into. So even if you decide not to go into human services, you can use this a lot. So another place, too, is you can use this in case management in order to get a good sense of kind of what's going on. Um, you could use this within family therapy to do kind of an initial consultation or interview um, to figure things out. So really, this is a skill about how to have a really good conversation, how to make people feel comfortable um, so that you can get the best information for what you, what you need. So that's, so that's a little bit about, about the why. why. So, so let's, let's go into you throughout the um, PowerPoint a little, a little bit more about what an in-depth interview really consists of. Hey all, so why do we use
So what is an in-depth interview exactly? An in-depth interview is open-ended, and so there aren't many expectations about where it is going to go. Obviously, there'll be some purpose for the interview, but there may, it may not be, um, it, it, it's going to allow for there to be kind of open-ended questions and open-ended answers as well. It should be discovery oriented, meaning that we are going to be discovering something. This is not about finding um, confirmation about knowledge that we already have. Um, we are going to be, this is about discovering something new. We'll also be exploring what people think or feel about a particular topic when we do an in-depth interview, and that could be on a variety of subjects. We're going, the word explore is very important, um, in that we, again, are not having a set path or plan um, as far as um, gaining particular feelings or particular thoughts um, on, and trying to glean that from someone. We are really just in an exploring um, phase of finding out what people's thoughts and feelings are on a particular topic. Finally, we are collecting background information on a particular subject in order to learn something new. There are four main elements to an in-depth interview. The first is asking open-ended questions. An open-ended question gives you more information and answers why or how. So an, an example of an open-ended question would be, um, would be, what do you think about um, baseball? Okay, so it allows the person time and freedom to answer in their own words. Okay, a close-ended question would be something like, do you like baseball? Yes or no? Okay, it, would, it gives, it almost gives them um, just a yes or no answer. An open-ended question allows somebody the ability to speak longer and give you more information for whatever purpose you are needing this in-depth interview for. Secondly, there is, um, a semi-structured format. So while you'll have to pre-plan some questions, you allow for you allow the freedom um, for the conversation to go elsewhere. Okay, which also may give you um, a richness and a depth to your information. So this this would entail you asking additional questions beyond those of the pre-planned questions. It's very conversational um, and it can help give you more information. Thirdly having seek understanding and interpretation. So Stephen Covey, I would highly recommend any of his books. One of them, um, he wrote, he does the, um, the Franklin Covey planners and he really helped to revolutionize time management and whatnot. But one of the things he said, um, he wrote um, the seven habits of highly effective people. And one of those habits was seek to understand and then be understood. And so one of those pieces is that you're seeking from this other person some you're seeking um you're seeking understanding sorry you are looking to understand where they are coming from sorry about that seeking to understand where they're coming from okay and so with that you're also um you're doing a lot of active listening you're asking clarifying questions such as huh would you mind explaining that one more time to me in another way um, so that I could understand it more clearly. Oftentimes people are very open to that because it shows that you are interested in what they have to say. Okay. Um, fourthly and lastly, recording responses. So you want to have some means to be able to record the conversation. Although you may be a great note taker or you think you may remember a lot of things about the conversation, if you're doing anything for any sort of um, research or if you are doing anything for um, to be able to gain information for a specific purpose, it is helpful to record your responses, okay? So you want to record both verbal and nonverbal behaviors, okay? So if someone says, 
I'm having a great day, right? And that's the verbal response. The nonverbal behavior, what if they have their arms crossed and they have their, their eyebrows are all stretched together and they look like they're having a really not great day, right? That would be inconsistent between the verbal and nonverbal behaviors. So the nonverbal behaviors are all the other things that somebody is communicating that is outside of the verbal piece, okay? There are four main elements to an in-depth interview. The first is asking open-ended questions. An open-ended question gives you more information and answers why or how. So an, an example of an open-ended question would be, um, no matter if you are recording on a video, you want to keep be, some written What do you think about what you are thinking um, baseball? Or what you are okay. noticing. So um, it allows the person, person time and freedom to answer in their own way. So some of you may be wondering, what are some do's and don'ts um, in an interview? So we went over the do's, but here are some of the things to avoid in an interview. So one of them is 
to not focus on weakness. And so we want to be sure to, re to recognize strengths and not to kind of go after some major weaknesses. So even if you are evaluating a problem, it can be very helpful to find out what solutions have people um, tried to implement um, or tried to do, um, because focusing too much on weaknesses could shut that person down who you are interviewing. The next piece is um, try not to, to resist, try to resist the need to rescue someone. When we say this, we mean you don't want, someone might start to feel a little uncomfortable um, with maybe some of the questions being asked. And so instead of jumping in and answering for them, um, please just allow them a little time in silence to be able to, um, to figure it out themselves because they're oftentimes people are very capable of um, being able to answer it themselves. You just gotta give them a little time to kind of put some of their thoughts together. So rescuing them too early can actually um, be harmful um, in that it kind of shows you might not have as much faith in them um, as as you um, might as as might be as you might want to show, right? That's probably not what you're thinking at all when you're trying to rescue. You just don't like somebody to feel uncomfortable. But um, that could be something that you inadvertently communicate to that person. Okay, the next one is being overly passive. So you want to have some show that you are in the driver's seat when you are conducting these interviews. It shows a level of professionalism um, to step into um, the seat of the interviewer. Okay. Um, another piece is if you show a lot of discomfort with emotion. So if someone starts to have a little bit of an emotional reaction because it's very much um, has to do with um, where they are right now or with the the subject material that you don't shy away from um, talking about emotion or allowing them the space to be able to show that emotion, not shutting it down right away. So um, when I worked at the hospital, sometimes they um, even discouraged us from um, handing people tissues because they said it can inadvertently show that you're trying to shut down that emotion. Now, whether or not that is correct or not. I know a lot of people appreciate that little show of humanity to hand someone a tissue. Um, I don't know if that's going a little far, um, but you want to be sure that you just allow people to express their um, emotions and feelings. Um, the fifth one um, doesn't happen very often, but definitely not um, something to do in an interview, is to show anger. Um, so um, as a professional, you're really trying to show that you um, are able to emotionally regulate yourself. And so um, when you are doing an interview, if you show that you get angry because of a response of a client um, or of, of your interviewee, um, then that can be problematic for many reasons. Okay, so especially if they are showing some um, strong emotions, um, you know, because they are passionate about a topic, you might be equally as passionate about the topic. You just might have a very different opinion than them. And so um, just try and keep some of that, uh, those emotions that you are having in check so that that other person has room to be able to express their emotion and you can get more quality information um, for whatever, um, whatever interview you are doing. The last one, and this is a really tricky one, is to be sure that you don't come off as condescending. So I'm sure that each one of us have had a situation where we have felt like um, the person that was talking to us thought of us as less than um, who we were or who they were. So um, just watch that, watch that piece and just keep in mind that no person is above or below um, us and that and and to keep um, to be sure not to um, speak in a way um, where it might be perceived that we are looking down or we are better or we're coming from a better place um, than someone else. So some of you may be wondering what are some do's and don'ts
Some skills and attributes of an interviewer are being open-minded, being flexible and responsive, being patient, being observant, both with nonverbals and verbals, and being a good listener. So um, you'll see this um, YouTube interview. Um, I'm gonna see if I can try and embed it within um, the PowerPoint. If not, I will um, link it to your course documents so that you can watch it. It's a really good one that speaks to how to be a good listener. A few skills specifically about being a good listener is attending fully to what is being said so that the full attention um, is um, on the speaker. Um, so being a good listener means that you are not um, thinking about what you're going to say next um, or um, thinking about um, maybe what you're gonna have for dinner later on that night, um, but that you are fully listening so well to the speaker that you might even be able to paraphrase back what they said, which is our next one is paraphrasing. Paraphrasing shows that we are listening so intently um, that we can rephrase in our own words what they are saying back to us. Okay. Reflecting is another key skill of a good listener. So reflecting back um, to, um, to the speaker, both um, tone and emotion. Um, so this tone uh, might be, so if they are expressing, they're expressing sadness or they are expressing a lot of emotion, um, you know, that we would kind of mirror that. Not that, you know, if they're being very angry that we would then be angry too, but that we would recognize their passion about something and um, and reflect that tone by saying something like, wow, it sounds like you're very passionate about this. Or, um, yeah, I could see where this would be heated. You could tell that in my voice that there's a little bit different tone than, yeah, I could see where you would feel that. So anyway, mirroring that tone and that emotion can be very important for being a good listener. This is the YouTube video, um, 10 ways to have a better conversation, or sorry, TED Talk. Um, I will post that to your course documents because I'm not sure what it will do if I have um, it play within the PowerPoint. Okay, so, so how, how do we go we about conducting, conducting this great, great in-depth in interview? interview? So, so you, don't you don't have to start, to start from, from scratch. scratch. There, is there is actually a method that, that is very good, good um, to, to help, help you um, to, create to create this in-depth in interview. interview. Okay, so, so the, the first, first um, number, number one, one stage is called thematizing. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but we're gonna go with that, thematizing. And so this is creating themes, and so what we really want to do, it's, it's pretty simple in that we are wanting to make sure that whatever we do, we have a purpose to it. So if we're going to do an interview, we are going to clarify within our minds what the purpose is for this interview. This is important for a couple reasons. One, so that we know what direction we are headed into and what this is going to be used for. But also secondly, so that we truly honor the time that our interviewee is being is putting into um, into putting into our essentially our project. So that is stage number one. So to get a really clear picture of why we are doing what we are doing. Okay. That also is going to serve for some motivation later in your project where um, you might be thinking, why am I even doing this? Right? This helps if you really clarify in the beginning. Um, again, with Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind was another one of his um, seven principles. Um, so begin with the end in mind um, and really clarify why you are doing what you're doing. Secondly is the designing part. Okay, so how are you going to get this information? What is the best way? So you also don't have to start from scratch there. There is a um, whole section of qualitative research where you can um, get some information about how would be the best way to get information. You can talk to faculty members about it. You can talk to um, other professionals about um, what would be the best way to gain information. Okay, you wanna have some focus, um, be consistent and stay on track. And so having a good design at the beginning can help with that, okay? Stage three is interviewing, okay? So you're going to 
um, interview, you're going to choose who you were interviewing and, and actually go do the interviewing process. Um, within those interviews, you want to really create comfort and ease. So I remember when I worked at a, the children's um, residential facility, there was a program manager who said one of the things that he did in an interview, when he was interviewing for job interviews, was he actually created something, a very um, calm and comforting atmosphere because he said that that actually gave him the most amount of information. Now, sometimes that gave him information that maybe was... Um, where people felt so comfortable that they shared some information that maybe they shouldn't have shared on a job interview and that, you know, may have cost them that job. But at the same time, um, he was able to get the information about whether or not they would be a good fit for that particular job role. So, um, so that's one purpose for creating comfort and ease, but you will get more information if someone feels comfortable. Okay. Um, and another piece that can also create some comfort is to explain the recording procedure. And you'll also need to do this for legal purposes as well, so that somebody knows that the interview will be recorded. They also will probably ask, and you should give them information as far as how that um, data will be stored. So how will that recording be stored? Will it be secure? Because they may not want to have what is shared with you um, uh, given out um, or, or seen by other people. Okay. Stage four is transcribing. Okay, so this can be a very lengthy part of your interview. So I would give it um, quite a bit of time. Um, so if you um, transcribing is going to be taking on um, everything that the that you have said and that the interviewee has said and actually typing it out um, so that you have a transcript um, of everything that was said. So this is the text of the interview. Okay. Um, stage five, after you've done that, is analyzing. So part of the analysis is you're going to be identifying themes further. Um, and so within these interviews, you might have found that um, many times people have uh, mentioned, um, that many times people have mentioned um, that Sorry, at that point, my kids uh, both uh, walked in, or one one child walked in, and the other one, um, I think, was carried in. Anyway, so um, so to get back to our lesson, so oftentimes um, across interviews, there could be certain themes that emerge. So say that you're doing a um, an interview of several. Um, about working conditions and migrant farm workers. Um, so say that one of those emergent themes is access to a nutritious food, that that comes up as a presenting concern um, for um, migrant farm workers. And so that might be a theme that you would identify. Um, again, I'd like to say, so with stages five, um, five, six, and seven, you'll notice there's an asterisk next to it. And that means that this, these are not appropriate for all sorts of interviews, but only certain types of interviews, such as ones used for research um, or those that are used um, for um, other, other types of um, so qual some qualitative interviews and whatnot. Stage six is verifying. So in this stage, we would use triangulation where we would use um, multiple measures. And what triangulation means is that we are bringing an independent person in to see if they are seeing the same things that we are when we are identifying themes. Lastly is stage seven, and that would be reporting our findings. And this could be in a written or oral report. So a written report might be something like a paper a peer review in a peer reviewed journal, or it could be something like a um, speaking in a conference um, or giving out this um, information in front of a board um, to um, disseminate the information further. Okay, and so again with the asterisks, these might not be required or appropriate in every situation. Okay, so how do we go so, about? So, how do we go about?
Hey. Okay, so another piece um, that can be um, that, that runs on, on the border as far as important for um, these interviews is self-disclosure. So self-disclosure is sharing personal details in order to join or create trust. We have to be a little bit careful here because we don't want to share 
too many personal details because that could a take away the attention away from the person we are actually speaking to um, and it would also it, it could also um, make the um, interviewee uncomfortable um, with um, because we have not really gotten to know that person um, really well so we have to be careful with the level of self-disclosure that we have but things um, we could share um, specific personal details that may be ones that are um, fairly common um, to share. Um, so like thoughts of like, you know, what did you, you know, yeah, I, you know, what did you think of that rainstorm the other day? That's a shared experience of you, you had, you saw that rainstorm, that other person saw that rainstorm. That might be a personal detail that might be appropriate to share or, um, you know, sharing, you know, something like, you know, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been interesting. This, uh, the whole, um, you know, it's been interesting, you know, um, the whole quarantine thing, you know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I know for me that it's been very difficult for me and my family. So that might be an appropriate detail to share. What might not be appropriate to share are things that are um, very personal to you about your relationships, um, maybe about your um, specific things about your children, if you have children, um, your um, specific um, political views or feelings, um, and thoughts. Um, so um, just be a little bit careful with sharing personal details. So the activity for this particular lesson are to identify what are some pros and cons of sharing your personal life and attitudes with clients. So this will be on the discussion board. There is a separate discussion board for this. Um, and then also to say what should not be shared. Okay, so that's the activity and you feel free to post your thoughts on the discussion board. Okay, so this one, um, there's other interview questions. This is actually used, um, the miracle question is actually used um, <clears throat> in um, a particular solution-focused therapy. Um, it's called the miracle question. Um, I have um, an interesting relationship with this question. Sometimes I love it, sometimes I really don't. Um, but it is um, a thought-provoking question. So miracle question is, what if you woke up tomorrow morning and found that a miracle had happened and that your biggest problem was gone? How would you know and what would be different? While this might be really helpful for particularly a couple in conflict, um, it might not be so helpful for someone who has been through a traumatic incident um, or for someone who is struggling with a health diagnosis um, such as um, cancer um, or a terminal illness um, that, that could actually cause some harm. So question lead-ins can be, how do you want your life to be different? What would you do instead? Tell me the reason instead of why? Um, so why can be um, sometimes perceived as, um, you know, an, with a judgment attached to it. And so if someone says something and you're curious about um, to hear more thoughts, you can tell, well, tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, you can also lead in a question with, suppose, um, suppose something, um, uh, let's see, suppose, um, Suppose something were different in your life, what would that look like? Okay, or how will you know is another um, example of a question lead in. When things are different, what would that look like? What would be helpful? These are all questions that can lead to more thoughtful and in-depth answers for your interview. All right, well, we made it through our first PowerPoint. Um, this one has been um, quite an adventure. I can't tell you how many times I've done re done this PowerPoint and then redid this PowerPoint um, based on some of the technology, um, but hopefully they will get better than this is my hope. But I really wanted to be able to cater to those who are more auditory learners, who are visual learners, still working on the kinesthetic learners, um, but we will try and find a format that works for you all um, during this time. So summary final thoughts, in-depth interviews allow for the collection of more information. Conducting an in-depth interview is a skill and it takes practice too. So it's something that you can develop over time. Your first interview, if it doesn't go well, believe me, um, it probably it probably will not unless you are a very talented interviewer from the start. But um, I know from personal experience, my first interviews did not go well. So it takes practice and it can be developed as a skill. 
Active listening is very important. Um, Open-ended questions um, are also key to gaining more information. All right, thank you all.